Good morning, everyone. Um, if you could take your seats, we're about to begin. Um, so good morning and welcome to the open forum of the Internet Governance Forum. And thank you for joining us today as we discuss the future of artificial intelligence and sustainable development. My name is Wadzanai Motsi Katai, and I will be your moderator for this discussion. And as we know, artificial intelligence presents the new frontier for the fourth industrial revolution, providing opportunities to leapfrog traditional parts of industrial evolution. However, this field also comes with limitations in terms of capital, capacity, access, and information, as they are not universally available in emerging economies. And so today we'll focus a lot of our discussion on a new initiative to try and bridge this gap called the Fair Forward Artificial Intelligence for All Initiative by the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, which aims to facilitate more inclusive and sustainable and like its name, fair practices in artificial intelligence. Sharing their perspectives on this project today and its importance and opportunities are our guests, Mark Holtzberger, Odas Nyonkuru, Mila Romanov, and Lukas Bokowski. Please help me in welcoming our guests to the panel today. If you can give them a round of applause. Um, we will begin with Mr. Holtzberger, who's the representative for the Directorate of Digital Technologies and Development Cooperation from the BMZ. With over 20 years of experience, he's worked as a consultant for migration, integration, and refugee policy for the Green Party and the Bundestag. And today, he'll be introducing the project to us um, and speaking from the BMZ's perspective. Mr. Holtzberger, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Distinguished participants of the IGF, Mrs. Romanov, good morning. You and Koro, Mr. Good morning. And Mr. Bukowski. Wonderful ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Holzberger, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, on this open forum of the IGF. This panel today is called The Future of Artificial Intelligence and Sustainable Development. And it's hosted not just by the BMZ, but also by the United uh, Nations Global Pulse, Mrs. Romanov. And it's following a pre-event on Monday on AI in Africa. And during the 60, uh, following 60 minutes, we will, at this IGF meeting, unveil a major new initiative of our ministry on, on AI. Um, and to illustrate the emergence importance of AI, let me please tell you briefly a story from four weeks ago. As you know, Germany has regular consultations with its partner countries to discuss the priorities on how to achieve social and economic progress. And recently, we had these discussions with India. And for the first time, AI was the, topic, uh, the top topic on the list, and the question how Germany and India could cooperate closely on this issue. And in the end, the first two pages of the final conclusions of our governments were covered only by the topic of AI. That shows that Germany and India have learned at least one lesson, that digital transformation is not optional. And as a member of the BMZ Division for Digital Technologies and Development Cooperation, I can tell you that my ministry focuses on many topics of utmost importance, fighting poverty, ending hunger, or addressing the effects of climate change. However, we know we need to rely and to build on the potential of digital approaches if we want to achieve the SDGs by 2030. Developing, developing uh, and emerging countries cannot and should not be excluded from this ongoing fundamental techno technological change. This is how we interpret, interpret the leave no one behind principle of the Agenda 2030. Otherwise, we will face an alarming innovation gap and a growing digital divide. As of now, half of the world population is still offline. Millions of women 
are fewer online than men, more than Nigeria's and Kenya's combined population, and less than 1% of all patents worldwide derive from at least developing countries. So what is my ministry doing to address these challenges? Well, first, the BMZ has drawn recently a clear strategy on digital transformation. Second, the BMZ has stepped up funding in the area of digital transformation and is running over 550 projects in over 90 countries. And third, we now start to focus on key technologies for development. And AI is, without any doubt, one of these key technologies. And as I said, we need that digital technologies and therefore also AI to achieve the above-mentioned SDGs. On the other side, we are convinced that artificial intelligence has to be anchored locally. And we say AI should not just address the benefits of a few, but should instead empower all people and communities. And from this background, I am proud to announce the official kickstart of our flagship project, Fair Forward, Artificial Intelligence for All, here and now at the IGF 2019. Uh, and, <laughs> and I'm thankful and really honored that we're doing this not just on our own, for goodness sake not, that we, can, but that we can work and cooperate with strong partners in Asia, in Africa and worldwide, and some of them will tell you uh, in a second. But coming back and to explain the approach of our flagship project, let me just explain to you the abbreviation FAIR. You all know this word, but so FAIR is F, A, I and R. And let us start with the F, like framework. Fair forward adv advocates value-based AI, which is rooted in human rights, international norms, and privacy. Fair forward wants, therefore, to support our partners to develop a specific policy framework which, uh, which will allow a locally rooted, responsible, and ethical use of AI. And Ms. Romanov, please tell us something about it in a, in a few seconds, right? Now, to, uh, let us move for, um, onward to the A, like anchor. Fairward Forward will anchor or focus its action by building local technology know-how on AI in Africa and Asia. The third capital letter is I, like integrate. We will strive to integrate best practices of digital learning and training for the development of AI in our partner countries. And finally, we have the R, like responsibility or responsible data. Many of you will know knowledge of AI programming is not enough to create AI applications. In order to develop and train AI, you need data, and I mean a lot of data. But one of the major problems in many places are missing data or biased data. In fact, many of our partner countries face a lack of accessible data that fits to their local context. And that is why we want to remove entry barriers to AI and, and improve access to local training data and open source AI technology. Let me give you just a brief idea on what a, a Fair Forward is aiming for. You do not, perhaps you do not know, you, I don't know if you all are, uh, sorry, I do not, I do not know if you all are aware, but okay, all voice assistants work on AI, and all of the major commercial uh, applications understand English, French, Chinese, and even German, but none of them understand any African language. They work for the, f they work for the sake of a few, and not for the majority of the world. And try, for instance, and ask Siri in Kenya, Rwanda, how, to, how the weather will be in Kigali today or tomorrow. That regularly drives Siri mad. 
We believe that open access to African and Asian voice data is a key focus area, and that is why our flagship Fair Forward wants to support local innovators developing AI-based voice technologies so that more people can benefit from this digital transformation. And I'm looking forward to you, Mr. Nkura, to your presentation. He's our partner in Rwanda and will talk about his ongoing work there. Voice technology deliver value to local populations in their own languages, for instance, either to include digital interaction with government services or to provide small farmers with voice-enabled information services. And Mr. Bukowski, he will give us his, future, his vision of uh, such a future. Let me finally announce the start of a strategic partnership between my ministry, the BMZ, and the browser company Mozilla. Together, we not only work on this collection of voice data, in fact, we want to build an alliance for open voice data and technology with Africa and Asia. And I just to recommend to check Twitter for more news on this partnership. All our, ex uh, all our activities are based on a close dialogue with our partner countries. And this is why we are here today. We want to start a dialogue with the IGF community on how we can make sure that AI supports sustainable development in the future and how we can avoid that growing global digital divide. I will end by repeating our vision for Fair Forward. Our main aim is to build a more open, more inclusive and more sustainable approach to AI and let's join our forces on this. And I am looking forward to the discussion with you and to the panel now. I want to make I want to thank everyone for here for joining online or offline to bring development cooperation closer to digital transformation. And thank you. Thank you very much for that inspiring opening. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Odas Nyongkuru, CEO of Digital Umuganda, a company working to reduce the digital divide gap in Africa by democratizing access to information and technology services. As you've just heard, Digital Umuganda is part of the Mozilla Common Voice Project, which is developing digital voice assistance in Kenya, Rwanda. Here to share his insights and perspectives on AI and sustainable development, please help me in welcoming Mr. Nyongkuru. You have the floor. Uh, I will be talking more about the R in FAIR, which is responsible data. And um, as you know, um, we've been working with Mozilla as well as the GIZ in Rwanda to build open voice data sets. And I'm going to cover how we're doing that and why exactly we're doing that. Um, you might have seen this number uh, over and over again at the IGF, 53.6%. Um, and, and this is the official number from the ITU about talking about um, the number of people in the world connected to the internet, 53.6%. So you could easily say that over 50% of the world is connected to the internet, which is a good milestone. But then again, 47 or 46.3% is not connected. And as you, as you see, uh, much of the unconnected people are coming from uh, developing countries, mainly 28.2% in Africa and 48.4% in Asian Pacific countries. And the problem is not only about connection, but also access to information and services on the internet. The internet is heavily skewed towards English and other major languages. And having an open voice data sets will help solve that challenge because English is only spoken by 20% globally and only 5% natively. So you can imagine what this leaves for the 48, um, for the 43 percent of the people who are not connected to the internet, not only because of lack of infrastructure, but lack of uh, access to services and information in their local languages. And this is mainly the major uh, challenge that we're solving. 
Um, and the question becomes, how do we make technology more inclusive uh, for people who do not speak uh, um, major languages that are, are accessible on the internet? And we believe um, through the partnership of Mozilla and BMZ, as well as the local partners, Open Voice Dataset is going to be a major uh, solving uh, uh, solution to that. Um, that is why in Rwanda we partnered uh, with Mozilla as well as GIZ and BMZ on bringing these voice data sets and we're doing that through the community. So it's not only about uh, the way we access data but how we build it, how we, ma how we maintain it and how we govern it. And we're, we're doing that towards a more community-based approach approach where uh, the community is participating in building the voice data set, but also the innovators in the community will be the one who are innovating on top of these data sets. Here we will have uh, an ecosystem uh, of voice technology that would otherwise not be accessible because of the heavy uh, investment needed to bring the infrastructure needed for voice interaction in local languages. And we're doing that, as you see, our name is called Umuganda, and you might wonder what Umuganda is. Um, if you've been to Kigali, uh, I have a lot of people been in Rwanda already in the crowd? Oh, quite a few, yeah. If you've been to Kigali, um, every last Saturday of the month, uh, we have uh, Umuganda, which is basically people coming together to build infrastructure, and this has normally targeted physical infrastructure, which is roads, which is, uh, might be hospitals, or um, schools, depending on the needs of the community. And our, um, our thesis is how do we bring that to the digital age? Because with the digital age come new challenges and new infrastructure to be built. And what we're doing is adapting um, uh, a rather solution that's rooted in the Randi's culture to build digital infrastructure because it engages um, a, 90, 80% of the population, and it's a spirit that's already there and can be adapted to digital infrastructure as well. So it came from um, people working on a normal physical infrastructure in Uganda like this, and has been um, upgraded to this. So this is one of, 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 of our digital Uganda events, and here we're collecting voice data in our African Leadership University, and this is how we are building uh, the data set by having people come around uh, in events like this to build the data set. Um, and not only are these people, uh, universities, we're working with universities, not only are they helping in building it, but also they're the innovators uh, that will be building solutions on top of it. So in some sort of way, we're also uh, leveling the playing field so that not only global companies are able to uh, build solutions, um, but also local innovators are able to build solutions for the local communities, and hence allowing um, innovation to come from all over the world in the places we would least expect it. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's, uh, thank you in Kenya Rwanda, it's Murakoze, so uh, maybe one last word of Kenya Rwanda you can learn as well. Thank you, and there will be time to ask our panelists questions following all their presentations. Um, our next speaker is Mila Romanov, the lead for data policy and governance at the UN Global Pulse. She is responsible for establishing sustainable mechanisms for public-private partnerships, as well as responsible use of big data for global development and humanitarian action. Her vast experience also spans commercial litigation and data security, privacy and communication. So please help me in welcoming Mila Romanov. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to our co-host uh, and uh, key partners in the Global South, um, BMZ and GIZ. Uh, very pleased to be here um, and uh, continue these discussions that were actually started on day zero uh, with our director, Robert Kirkpatrick, um, also opening up the panel speaking about the challenges and opportunities in the Global South that AI brings. And um, I'm happy to um, give you a little bit of an introduction of um, the work that we are starting to do and what we have done so far. So Global Pulse is a special initiative of the UN Secretary General, and uh, which is tasked with the mission to um, understand and, uh, and bring up the value of big data and artificial intelligence um, to help the achievement of the sustainable development goals. 
uh, global pulse functions to three tracks. The key ones is uh, the scale and discovery, and um, the third one is policy. And policy includes um, understanding and also developing mechanisms for the governance of data and the governance of the artificial intelligence. And I will speak about the uh, governance today. If we are, um, we are currently working, we have a lab in um, Kampala, our Pulse Lab Kampala, and we have a lab in our regional lab in Asia, in uh, Jakarta, in Indonesia. And through our regional hubs, um, we are uh, working with the governments across the regions to first understand the challenges that emerging technologies bring to the global south. And then second, try to address these challenges with the key partners. And today I will be talking about how we are doing this, particularly in the African region. We, are, we have started work with our uh, partners, uh, BMZ and GAZ, um, a few years ago. And uh, we'll continue this work going forward within the next two to three years. We're um, looking at how, well, first of all, what value artificial intelligence brings to the global south. And through that, we are partnering with uh, private sector companies, academia, through key partnerships in developing tools and developing software that first helps understand uh, what type of data do you need, what type of technology do you need to understand the needs of the local communities in the global south. And we started this work in Ghana and Uganda. One of the interesting projects that we've been um, working on is actually um, speech to text through, um, through collecting publicly available data from radio. As you, will all, as you would all know, um, in the Western world, we're working with uh, social media data, right? Social media data is one of the most powerful resources. Uh, but what would we do in Africa? It's mobile data and it's also, um, and, it's, and it's radio data. But in order to understand the localized languages, we have to build um, software, right, to understand the languages and then to translate it into the context of those economies. Um, that's one of the projects and there is many more. But the key question when we think about it is what types of frameworks do we need in order to understand and utilize this value? And the frameworks around responsible use of such technologies, the frameworks that actually not only uh, bring the value of data and artificial intelligence in the economical sense, but also actually empower people from all sorts of human rights perspectives. And um, as the key here, the fundamental uh, question here is the right to privacy. And we've been working on developing the data privacy and data protection leg regulation um, with the open request of different governments across the global south as well as in, uh, in, within the European Union. Um, we've, we've started work within the, uh, within, across the United Nations system as well to um, as well unlock the power of data through developing governance, governance data governance frameworks um, uh, within the um, resident coordinators offices and also within the, um, uh, with, with the UN specialized agencies. Through this work, we're hoping, based on our learning on our own experiences and our own work within the UN system, uh, we hope to translate the same experiences and pilot the governance frameworks um, empowered by the local communities, bringing them through the consultation processes, like in Uganda and also in Ghana, to build the governance framework and to help governments build responsible governance framework for artificial intelligence and, um, and data to ensure that the value of data is unlocked. Just the session before that, that took place um, basically an hour ago, stressed and our, the special advisor um, to the Secretary General with Fabrizio Hoschild um, actually brought up an idea um, that was translated through the high-level panel on digital cooperation by the Secretary General of actually establishing the regional help desks as one of the ideas to bring the local communities um, and bring the local needs into the development of such governance frameworks. That's one of the key recommendations that also came out of the um, high level of the report of the high-level panel on digital cooperation. Another important um, notion that we need to also not forget is the context. And so what we're trying to do in order to build the frameworks and to build governance framework around, uh, frameworks around data and AI is to actually the context in which such data and artificial intelligence will be used. Con we should never forget the context, right? And so one of the recommendations also of the high-level panel on digital cooperation to the Secretary General was also that 
in order to understand the value of artificial intelligence and data governance, we should bring the context, and particularly the context from the global south. So what are we trying to do um, in, in order to address these challenges? So in, um, in the work that we're doing now in Uganda and Ghana, that, that started actually with, uh, with supporting the government of Uganda in, in developing their data protection regulation, uh, bill, uh, data protection law, now in actually developing and supporting the president task, uh, special task force on the fourth industrial revolution to develop the ethical AI framework, framework supported also by our key partner, uh, BMZ and GAZ. And um, this work has been continued throughout the year and will continue into the, uh, into the future years as well. Um, it, it is built on the key consultations from the key stakeholders coming from the local communities. That's one crucial part and element of it. <clears throat> um, but then what was mentioned also in the previous discussion is data. Data is the key element, right? So in order to, before we start with the governance frameworks, we also need to understand how do we govern data? So, uh, and how do we give access to and unlock, um, unlock that data to feed into the artificial intelligence? So the second part of our work will concentrate as well as in Ghana and Uganda in actually building the, um, the sustainable economical infrastructure to unlock the power of data and develop frameworks, both the regulatory framework, the governance frameworks, as well as the technical frameworks for sustainable data access. And I want to stress, stress that the key is sustainable. Um, as we all know, the data now is actually being, unlock, being locked and, and held by a lot of the um, private sector com companies around the world. This is not only the problem of the global south. So our role here and the goal um, is to actually build the sustainable frameworks that would allow the private sector, um, NGOs, share the data with the public sector and the, the other way around while protecting, preserving the right to privacy and also bringing the right technical solution into place. So we're starting this, this is a, very, this is a huge project and quite important one, is actually figuring out the regulatory barriers and the technological barriers. And we will be looking for the partners on both fronts. Um, the process will start through a series of consultations that, we, that will be conducted at the national levels and also regional levels. And we will be seeking the support of the um, expert group on data governance and AI that Global Pulse has established in 2014, which also has experts on the rotational basis from around the world. But we will, in addition to the expertise of this group, we will, as I said, conduct a series of local consultation, bringing the expertise from the local communities. And taking this opportunity today at the IGF, I really hope that we will also find that expertise and that expertise will be reaching out to us within the next months and years to contribute to these really crucial discussions. Um, I would like to thank you again for the, uh, for the time and uh, invitation to be here, and I will be happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Mr. Lukas Borkowski, European Partnerships Lead for Viamo, which is a global social enterprise dedicated to helping individuals and organizations make better decisions about technology use and development. Mr. Borkowski is an ICT for Development Strategy, strategy and Development Expert, and he's here to share his insights as one of the partners in this new initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, I think I brought you a picture, but if not, I can also just uh, try to put your focus back on our target populations and on the people we actually do this for, the artificial intelligence and sustainable development. And if you imagine a smallholder farmer somewhere in, in Uganda or Rwanda, um, who is most likely part of the 43% that, that Odas referred to, we have to find a way to actually give them access to information in their moments of needs in their local language, and through the devices that they already have. And while we all hope for having universal mobile data coverage anytime soon, that's also a big dream. So tackling that opportunity and that challenge right now is what Viamo is doing. And we operate, uh, we're a global social business, we operate in about 30 countries, and I represent my, my colleagues, my local colleagues that actually do all the hard work. And what we do is we combine human-centered design, behavior change, communication, 
and uh, in the end also digital and appropriate digital technologies and we sit between mobile phone network operators, between social media channels and partners like GIZ or local governments to facilitate meaningful interactions with beneficiaries, meaningful interactions with smallholder farmers for, uh, in, for example or with um, young mothers that have questions about the health of their children. And, um, we try to change, change the paradigm in communication and give them access to information through, for example, simple mobile phone telephony. And the protocol that we're using, thank you, uh, the protocol that we're using or, or what we find out about these uh, target audiences is they're not only part of the 43% without access to internet, but they're also illiterate, usually. Um, they do not own smartphones, typically, and uh, given those factors, classic mobile phone communication through SMS services or the hyper-hyped uh, hyper USSD instances is meaningless because they cannot read or write a full sentence and they cannot interact with that communication. That's where we come in and work with our telecom partners and, and partners like GIZ to facilitate interactive voice response communication in pre-recorded audio messages in local languages. And right now, we, uh, we achieve a meaningful interactions with about 19 million uh, unique users per year in about uh, 300 million sessions uh, in 2018 alone. Um, and we're, it, it's, it's expanding not only uh, because of the opportunity, but because of the need. People need access to information when they need the information. We cannot wait for them to wait for a community health worker, to wait for a radio show or something else. They all want to have access to information as much as you uh, desire access to information right now on your smartphones. So I think that is very critical. Um, what we see with IVR is very powerful. 75% of all callers to our hotlines that we set up get through and make it to a key message, for example, on uh, best practice in breastfeeding or um, on gender-based violence or how to, how to grow maize. But that also means that we leave out 25%. 25% of people that actually do call fail to get through, simply because IVR, even though it's very simple, it might be too technically complex for people that are illiterate and never went to school. And that is why we're interested in voice recognition, and that is where this cooperation is coming in with GIZ and BMZ and Mozilla and, and the local partners like Odas because we want to work on voice recognition and we want to unlock voice recognition in local languages to make these services more accessible for local populations and their local languages and to close this 25% gap and do even more. Um, for now, as was mentioned uh, rightfully, the capital cost of developing such an algorithm and the technology behind it is extensively high. Even for a, a social business like Viamo, um, this is something we couldn't do ourselves. So this opportunity uh, of making that publicly available as an open source and also the training data is a game changer and again a change in the paradigm in communication international development. Because if you imagine that people soon in local uh, communities, in rural communities in Rwanda or DRC or Nigeria or India can call in and simply say, I want to know what the weather is going to be tomorrow, they will be able to make important decisions about growing the produce in a much more effective way, losing, not losing money anymore because of bad decision making and actually coming much closer to getting out of poverty. If young mothers can just call in and say, my child has blue pickles, what, what is the problem here? You will actually save lives with that. So I think that it's important by speaking, when we speak about frameworks, when we speak about regulation and, and responsible data, that's all very important. But I think it's really important to keep in mind why we are doing this. We're doing this, as, uh, as Mr. Holzberger said, to reduce poverty and to save lives. And that is what we're trying to do. Um, I think there are a lot of ethical questions on the way. Um, to be fair and frank, we do not have the answers to all of these. That's why work done by UN Global Pulse and others is really important because as a private company, in the end we're a social business, but that also means a private uh, company. We're subject in all these countries to the local data regulation and sometimes it's even contradicting to our ethical understanding of data privacy. Um, so it's not always that clear and there's no, no clear way forward right now. 
And that is why this work is important um, to really advance this and, and bring us in the future. And I think we also, what we can contribute as the private sector, certainly, uh, data. Um, because we have six million interactions right now every day on our platform um, through those services. So we can feed the data back in and I encourage other private sector players to appreciate that, uh, that approach and do equally because otherwise open source technology and open source voice recognition will not work. If we keep it behind closed doors, that will just again serve the very few um, and it will only be accessible to the big multinationals. So that is why uh, we fully follow this logic of open source, not only algorithms and technology, but also open source voice data. And uh, I thank you for that, for the great initiative, and let's, let's take that forward. Once again, thank you to all our panelists for sharing your perspective and comments um, on this new initiative. We'll kick off our offline question and answer session at the moment by taking two questions from the audience um, for our panelists to respond, and then we can take the next round, um, time permitting. So we have you, sir, and you, sir. Yes, please. Good, good, good morning. Thank you for a wonderful set of presentations. I am Guru from IT for Change. We are an NGO in India. We are also a member of the JustNet Coalition, uh, which looks at how we can come together and build a net that is just and equitable and works for everybody. Uh, <clears throat> the issue of uh, data protection and privacy of data and making data work for the global south, I think uh, many speakers spoke about. And uh, I wanted to bring one element uh, for discussion and for the views of the panelists. And uh, basically, if you look at data from a protection point of view, there are two aspects. One is the privacy, individuals' privacy. You don't want to violate that. You want to protect the interests of individuals. But I think uh, we need to look at another aspect which is not so much talked about, which is the economic value of the data itself. Now, I just want to bring a quick historical perspective. Uh, the developing yeah, I'll keep it very brief. This is a very important aspect, and I think this is ignored. So I just want to quickly, I will, I'll bring this element in, which is that if you take a historical perspective, the developing countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America have been, uh, for centuries, been the source of raw materials, which they export to the, the Europe and the developed world, and then they import back the finished goods. And the terms of trade are, have been so unfair which is one of the primary reasons why developing countries are struggling. And I think whether it's Rwanda in Africa or India in Asia or any country in the developing uh, world, we can see the same issue. If you look at today's situation, the richest companies in the world are data companies. So Uber is profitable not because it has a software platform, which may be free and open source, or because it has a fleet of drivers who are not its employees. It's rich because it owns data. Now, I think requesting companies and private sector to share the data I think you can't, that's the biggest asset. And uh, in India, we have a committee set up by the government of India, and the companies clearly tell the government that the data belongs to us. So I am interested very much in the panelists uh, exploring the issue of how do we make sure that the developing countries do not continue to remain exploited by the uh, private sector companies and the governments of the global north, and how we can make sure that the digital divide is not going to cause extraordinary inequality and inequity. And I think with data and AI, the situation is going to be much, much worse than the uh, situation we had centuries back. I think the issue of economic value of data, economic ownership of data by the Global South is extremely critical. I'll just end by uh, mentioning that the JustNet Coalition has come out with a manifesto for digital justice, copies of which are available uh, in the JustNet Coalition lobby. And the, first, the only principle of that, data subjects must own their own data individually and collectively. I think that's a very important principle that I would urge the panelists to think about and respond to. Thank you. I'm Safari. I'm an MP from uh, DRC. I've been uh, in different se a, a session, and I was uh, pointing out that we have a problem in Africa that uh, we are now, uh, those big uh, companies are getting data from us, but we, they are not helping us to 
uh, to catch up with those kind of issue of uh, artificial intelligence. And it's a good thing to know that uh, the German uh, cooperation have decided to help uh, Africa country to, uh, to catch up on that. Uh, but uh, my concern is that uh, uh, the way maybe the project was uh, designed, maybe the phase one, I don't know if there will be other phases, like the case for uh, the good project in Rwanda, uh, I, can pin, I can just show two your problem I have with that. First of all, it's, uh, uh, it's, it, it is the, it, it's still the same story. So you are getting Rwanda helping you to get the data. And after that, uh, I don't know what will happen. But I think as far as Rwanda is, uh, is some kind, somehow developed on uh, IT technology, you should also help them to not only provide you the input, but start even exploit themselves that input. I don't know the future of the project, but that will be a good thing because they are already somehow a step uh, before other country in Africa. So they can go at the next level and start even exploit, not only provide you the data only. And also on the language that you choose. Uh, you have all you have say Murakoze. I think few people know that la language, okay. But if you really want to help African country, there's also in a language that is, is identified as African language. I think anyone here, even if you haven't go in Africa, but you know Akuna Matata, that's Swahili. And that's more than 100 million people in Africa that speak that language. So the impact of that project, if you can associate, you have also in Uganda the same project, if you can associate that things also of getting voice from them, coping that project in Rwanda, also making it in Uganda and Kenya, it can help more African people where we need that voice services. We don't have people who know to, to read, to write, but if can, they can get data services through voice, it will be much better. Thank you very much. So are there any takers for that question? First, looking at the economic value of data, not exporting it as a raw material, and then also considering other languages for the project. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think I'm going to answer uh, the gentleman from India, as well as, as the MP from DRC, um, about um, data being exploited um, by uh, uh, the Global North, uh, not the Global South. I think a lot of what we're doing as well is working with the ecosystem and also the innovators in the space to bring these solutions on top of the infrastructure. So it's not only about having uh, an infrastructure or data set that nobody will use, but working with them and looking at solutions that will pr practically be there. So it's also um, a question of, of, of looking at how do we level the, the, the playing field for local innovators? Because normally data um, such as this is held by global companies and multinationals. And in this way, we are also giving the ability to local innovators. And, and there are a couple that come to us to events that say we, we already had solutions but lacked uh, data. And the, the solutions are there, the innovators are there. Uh, what's lacking was the infrastructure. So yeah, I, I believe um, the ecosystem is there and working with them to get use of this data set is also something that we're doing and will continue to do uh, in the progress of the project. And I guess um, for the scaling to other African languages, maybe um, BMZ would be more um, equipped to answer this, but I believe uh, the, the recently announced BMZ Mozilla uh, partnership is to scale to also other African languages as well, yeah. Um, I would like to share uh, some of the work to, that we're doing to address the exploitation and also the, um, the frameworks around data to bring up its economic value. So we've conducted a series of consultations over the last um, year um, and they're, they're continuing, actually the next one will be in, um, in a few weeks in Uganda. But so far we've done a few consultations in Ghana um, in the cooperation with the Ministry of ICT and also the Data Protection Office. 
And um, uh, some of the outcomes, and, and then pre prior to that, we also hosted consultation in Tunis uh, during the RightsCon. Uh, and the key question, one of the key questions that kept coming up is actually, how do we bring up the economic value um, without uh, jeopardizing the human rights, in particular the right to privacy? Um, and the second question that came up is, how do we bring in the, into the context of the African economies particularly, um, uh, and um, w what can we do about that? How can we ensure that the data that's there does not get exploited and stays within, uh, stays there? So um, I don't, we don't have so far the, the, the answer to everything. But we do have a roadmap, um, at least from the way the UN look, is looking at it. Um, one is, I mentioned earlier, is to bring up more and more experts from those countries. We can, t we can talk about the regional, but we also need to talk about the national context, right? Africa is big, and um, every culture is quite distinct, and, and even the communities within each country may be quite distinct one from another. So we need to really keep in, in, uh, in place the local the local context. So, um, so that's one key part to it. Um, and we need to make sure that these people, the people of these from these communities, are actually the ones that are deciding and developing the laws and the frameworks and the standards. And how do we get there? So we, we have this, you know, and this has been raised in um, previous sessions during IGF, is that we do have um, strong regulatory frameworks and examples from other parts of the world. And, um, and it has been brought up, and we've been listening, uh, that um, a lot of the times such frameworks are being simply used as examples in the, in the global uh, South context. So there is, there, is, um, there is advantages and disadvantages to that, as to any question, as, as to any solution. Um, the frameworks that have already been developed are quite tailored to the Western world economies, right? And taking those frameworks and bringing them into the Global South context can work, but only, only, if they're not copied and pasted as is, if they're, only, if they're looked at only as one of the examples of the best practices. And I can share it also from the uh, UN's perspective because the UN also has a specific um, it's not the same, but it has a specific, it has a mandate, it has a specific status, and it also needs to operate within a specific frame. So we also look at the best practices, but we also need to keep in mind where, how we are functioning and think of what, what, what operations we're delivering. So in the context of the Global South, and particularly in Africa, I'll, pick, I'll speak particularly for the African context, you need to, you know, we need to, we need to help, and the UN, that's the role of the UN, to bring in the context and the needs, the economical, cultural, social needs to the concepts of these, of these frameworks. One example is, um, you know, the, and I'm not, I'm not an African, but, but working with a lot of African colleagues is the Ubuntu. You know, the, the notion of openness and the notion of collective rights and, um, and how this is realized through the African context, right, through, through the African culture. How can we bring that into the best practices that are shaping out around the world and make these frameworks work for the African economies. So that's a question also to the audience and those particularly from the region. Maybe you will have an answer on how we can do that. Set third is thinking about the uh, collective rights, right? So we, lo we, talk, we look a lot about the uh, privacy as an individual right, but more and more so, especially when we think about the the Global South context, and especially African context, is um, the group rights, right? How can we use data to benefit the group rights? Not only one individual, but actually the community. And I think this is a quite distinct factor from any, uh, from any other part of the world, at least learning from the consultations that we've held is actually understanding how we can tr translate the use of data and the risks and harms that it brings to the group harms. And also, how does the group rights relate to the use of data? So think about it from the perspective of also using data for the good and also not using the data for the good. How can we balance the two? 
And I think a lot of the best practices and framework that are shaping around the world really forget the factor of what do we do if the data is not used. If you have a tool, and as a humanitarian, if you have a tool in front of you and you want to save a life, would you use it? Would you use that tool to save a life? Well, I'll tell you right now, there is really not enough uh, frameworks, regulatory frameworks, and even best practices that are recognized at the policy level that actually bring up this, this issue and allow for a safe and secure data sharing and use of by public, by, by, by public sector. And the, Fourth comment is also the industry. Industry is the key player here. But we should not forget that also that we need to think about the small businesses and, we, and only regulations around the world and the best practices are oriented at the big businesses. So we really need to think about the capacity, okay? The capacity of the small businesses, the capacity of the small communities and, um, and bring that into, the pers into perspective. Fifth point is capacity itself. African economies right now have, many of them already have data protection laws. Many of them already have um, initiated um, projects to establish data protection laws. Many already are undertaking efforts to actually have AI frameworks, AI governance frameworks. But the question, uh, but the question here is the capacity. Once you have these laws, once you have these frameworks, the next step is the implementation. And so I think, and I encourage us to also think about the capacity that needs to be built within these local communities to actually implement these laws. Which brings me to my final and sixth point, is that youth and education are the cru and crucial components, the key components to bring this over. And there, is, and there, will, there will be needs for resources, there will be need for cooperation uh, to make sure that the experts that are in these countries understand these laws, bring them to the industry, bring them to the NGOs and the civil society, as well as to the government. It relates to all sectors. There is cross-sector. There is a huge lack of capacity, and there is not enough of education and digital literacy brought up about these technologies, these new technologies, at, at very, very early stages of education. Um, so I'll close here and, um, and welcome any more questions or comments. Thank you. And hopefully you. answers that I, and to the questions I raised. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe we can take another round of two questions. Please keep them brief and then we can have two brief responses from our panelists. I know there was a question behind me, and there's um, Sir over there. Uh, my name is Mohamed El Bikri from Morocco, Data Protection Authority. Uh, I will be brief. So I read that the training data set will be open for crowdsourcing. Uh, I wonder how do you support local communities to feed, to feed the training data set? Thank you. Okay, my name is Jim Sindolufi, uh, Nigeria. I run uh, an IT firm, Contemporary Consulting. Well, we do know that uh, there has been concern with regard to how far AI can go, either for good or for evil. So the question is, uh, are we incorporating accountability by design, even into this project, accountability by design, that we, it must serve our purpose. It must be accountable to us because it has the possibility of getting out of hands down the line. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to respond to the last question of how far can AI go? Um, and I give you a very concrete example. So at Viama, we are experimenting with what we call internally, and forgive me for that, the Netflix approach. So recommendation engines for smallholder farmers or very rural populations. Now the big issue is, and we all know, um, that mobile phone numbers are not unique identifiers. That's something regulators don't want to hear because everyone has to sign up when they buy a SIM card, but that's the truth. You go into any rural area and you can buy a mobile phone with a SIM card that's already unlocked and registered to someone. That makes it extremely difficult, in addition to phone sharing, to develop recommendation engines for rural populations all around the world. And, um, one key technology that can solve that is voice biometrics. 
So voice biometrics, a voice print is like your fingerprint, but through your voice. It's already used by commercial banks in the global north, like in Canada. It's super secure. The technology is really not the problem. Um, but it's only super secure if you have the security in place. And security here, and I want to be frank from a private sector perspective, security is data security in, let's say, our basement. But it's also about the ethical security of the data through the regulation in those countries. And we operate in quite a number of, I'd say, high-risk countries where I'm not so sure if we would want to have that voice data linked or that voice print linked to a mobile phone number to get into the hands of, uh, of various actors in that country with vested interests. And that's a critical question because AI can go really far but do we want to take it that far? So it's, it's rather the, the question of count, accountability by design is also where do we put in the stopgap? And I'm not the one who's saying let's, let, let's, let's curtail the, the AI, but maybe we have to be smart and also use AI technologies to enforce that data security. And we had a few discussions on that here already um, in a few sessions. Um, and just quickly, because we were speaking about industry as the big player and uh, economic value of data, I, I would just, I, I'm going to be brief on that one. Um, when I was young and I needed the money, I studied economics. And um, so you always have uh, supply and demand. And I think there's an oversupply of that data and not a lot of demand, and specifically not a lot of demand from the private sector. And it's very true, we have to educate people, we have to work with local companies um, and local entrepreneurs to help them to get that. But the biggest demand for the data that we see for now is from the government space or from political actors. And when we speak about the economic value, we also need to speak about the political economic value of the data. And I, I, we, from a private sector perspective, at least from our, from our point of view, we need regulation and we need work done by UN Global Pulse and others to make sure that the data protection regulation in those countries not only protects the data, but also protects the data from political actors and vested uh, interests. Okay, any further comments? Um, I think there was a question about um, crowdsourcing. Is it, uh, if it's about data collection, um, I mean, if you go to the Common Voice platform, it's accessible uh, anywhere, and I'd encourage you to put in, to, um, put in uh, the Moroccan languages as well. Um, and the way we're doing it to, to engage the community is we're building around the, communi uh, the education community, so specifically around universities and high schools. Uh, we have a program called the Commoners, which is students engaged in, in, in data commons, and, and they're sensibilizing other students to, to engage in building this uh, common infrastructure, and as well as to take advantage of it and build solutions for, for um, local problems uh, that would be around, yes. So. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us and engaging in this discussion on the future of artificial intelligence and sustainable development. Some key considerations that were highlighted today, how, we, how can we use AI to serve and support development, primarily focusing on equity, access, and partnership, but also accountability, as we've heard from our audience. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the um, Fair Forward initiative, I think there are two representatives here. There's Balthus and Leah, if you could stand up. Real quick, so people know who you are. <laughs> Perfect. So if you have questions, comments, and would like to get engaged, please feel free to look for these two representatives after the panel and, and engage in the conversation. Um, I'd like to thank again the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and the UN Global Pulse for hosting us in our discussion today. And we look forward to continuing these discussions further. Thank you again. Enjoy your day. Um, and please give everyone a round of applause. Thank you. It is my understanding that there's a session after this, so if we could exit quickly and have our conversations in the foyer. Thank you. <laughs>